Transmissions jammed. Proximity coverage only. Backup activated. System rebooted. Caution. Entering Dark Zone. Hello greater YouTube area and the surrounding internet regions, this is Killer Cardinal DA7. To the surprise of many gamers out there, two big updates were announced and released recently. Dying Light is either performing a playtest for its Bad Blood PvP expansion releasing next year or it's going to be performing it. And The Division just released its free 1.8 update with new PvE zones, a reworking of their rogue system in the Dark Zone, a mess of tweaks to rewards from various activities, etc. I see these as surprising because Dying Light came out almost three years ago and The Division, while much younger, appeared to have fulfilled its three obligated expansions attached to its pre-release season pass slash gold edition. Thus, not too many people figured much more was going to happen with either title, but sure enough, both are still getting supported. I'd been working on a comparison of these two for a long while, and since they're both still apparently relevant, I decided now is a perfect time to release this morsel for thought, while at the same time adding even more to the end that, quite frankly, I really didn't expect to be adding, but feels good to discuss. Before I jump in though, I want to clarify one thing. As the title suggests, the initial comparison that I want to make here is purely conceptual. In other words, the concept of Dying Light and the concept of the Division are actually quite similar. Even though both games' mechanics and gameplay loop are largely different, Different. Dying Light is a parkour flavored first person zombie hunt and The Division is a third person cover based loot and shoot. On the surface it feels like comparing Far Cry to Diablo, not a whole lot seems the same. However, they're essentially about the same thing, even the opening cutscenes and sequences are similar. If you're a fan of one and haven't touched the other, tell me if this sounds familiar. You're an agent that's part of a shady group, you're being briefed on your mission as you get dropped into dangerous territory going through a viral outbreak that has claimed thousands of lives. Granted, The Division and the GRE have slightly different motives, but it's inevitable that a player will see the result and impact of this outbreak, and it's that actual impact and how it manifests that's different in both games, and it's where I think Dying Light got it a bit better. In his review of The Division, Angry Joe makes the great point that at no time do you ever really witness the effects of the virus as it's infecting someone. You see body bags everywhere, sure, but aside from some contaminated areas, the dark zone, and some Tom Clancy style cutscenes after finishing various missions explaining what the virus is, how it came to be, a little about what it does, and who is behind the bioterror attack on Black Friday, you don't get much experience with the virus up close in real time. You're not walking down a street in Manhattan and the civilian on the sidewalk suddenly starts coughing, they vomit up their guts and fall over, potentially spreading viral contagions everywhere. I put in plenty of time, that never happens. Mostly in the division, the worst of the initial disaster has already occurred, much in the same way the collapse already happened in the original Destiny. Sure, a large swath called the Dark Zone, right in the middle of Midtown Manhattan, taking up roughly a third of the size of the total game world, is heavily contaminated, okay. Though your gas mask nullifies the virus's effects and it doesn't deteriorate or need to be replaced, so aside from some slightly stronger enemies and random players who can potentially be hostile, the Dark Zone isn't any different from the rest of Manhattan. I'll admit I really haven't spent a lot of time in the Dark Zone, but even in the farthest north areas that were added fairly recently, no civilians are randomly breaking out into virus symptoms, allowing you to fully watch the sickness kill someone who was healthy moments ago, potentially giving you someone to save in real time, or just more insight into what the virus looks like when it actually takes hold in a body. Compare that to Dying Light, where even bumping into a simple, slow ambling biter is you experiencing the virus. You can see how it ate their skin away, caused their hair to fall out, and burned away their lips to reveal toothy grins. Most of us spend our time dealing with the living, so it's understandable that seeing body bags is a bit unrelatable as it presents something we don't deal with regularly and is mostly meant to cover up the appearance of corpses and make for easier transportation. The zombies on the other hand are busy lunging at you in the hopes that maybe they can take a bite. We don't typically deal with zombies on a regular basis either but you can see how the urgency is different. It's an important storytelling tool especially in interactive media to show what could eventually happen to you and put the ability to stop it or at least keep your character from falling victim in your hands. Dying Light does do that thing where the main character is apparently sick or infected and you wouldn't really know it outside of random moments where they cough or get a headache, which I find to be a really tired device, but outside of that, seeing the zombies shows you what the virus does to varying degrees based on the decay different zombies have suffered, what getting infected can lead to. Although the difference in the overall impact doesn't stop there. In the division, four militias or groups have risen in Manhattan following the bioterror attack and are causing trouble. The rioters, the low-level criminals, barely any armor or hardware, small-time guys, the cleaners, which consist of city workers armed with flamethrowers looking to burn the virus away, and anyone including civilians who are infected, the Rikers, former inmates at Rikers Island Prison complex, and the last man battalion, a private military company. But like I said, outside of a handful of locations that are infected, the virus itself, which is a bit scarier than the human enemies you face, is pretty much contained by the time you arrive on the scene. You're mainly there to maintain order and handle any uprisings or problems. In Dying Light, not only is the virus still impacting thousands as you walk around the world, but it's everywhere. Not just in specific spots, everywhere. In a sense, you're traversing a massive dark zone in order to reach little tiny safe areas, with the virus uncontained and having the potential to spread outside of the fictional city limits of Haran. The safe 
areas in Dying Light don't even look that safe. Some man-made barricades, razor wire, spikes, tall fences, nothing impressive. The Division safe houses, on the other hand, you can enter them from the street, down an alley, through a wide open door, up or down some stairs, and while some of them are a bit dingy, one is a gymnasium with cots, another is a sewer, another is in a cave, a few of them look pretty comfy with a fireplace, armchairs, bookshelves. Your equipment tells you you're safe, but the door is right friggin' there. There's not a damn thing safe about that. In terms of the human element, there's plenty of it seen in both games, though in the Division, most of the people you see needing help are seen in two ways. One way is that you'll meet a random civilian on the street and they'll need simple things like soda, canned goods, water, energy bars, or even med kits, items that you can use yourself in battle as consumables. Early on in the Division's life cycle, handing those items over to a civilian in need would just get you a really crummy low-level item to be sold or broken down, but a past update changed this to also provide you with target intel, which can be used to activate high-value target hunts for greater rewards. Could conceivably make sense that a random civilian may have overheard something or traded some info for supplies. Of course, their AI isn't all that great. They'll occasionally wander into a firefight or not run for their lives when one breaks out nearby. What may be even funnier, depending on your sense of humor, if you hear a little electronic beep from your HUD, but you don't see the person that needs help soon enough, you could be running over to them, arrive, you could be holding a square button to give them something, but before holding the button can initiate the command to give them the thing, they get pissed at you and walk away with some rude comment like, you don't care about us. Like, I tried to help you, my, my button didn't work. Breaks immersion just a little. The other way you see people in danger in the division is through collectibles, like echoes. You activate one and a 3D still of a scene appears while audio plays in the background. Usually it's a sad story of someone being denied help by city officials during the initial moments of the outbreak or getting brutally murdered by one of the enemy factions, things like that. In addition to the echoes, you can also find phone conversation collectibles littered around the game world, meant to show you brief personal mini stories of average lives torn apart by bioterrorism, maybe even attempting to make you think about real life places affected by bioterror. Things like that are obviously intended to evoke emotion. The majority of the marketing for the game talked about save what remains. The developers put out little vignettes about families and friends suffering and dying in New York. Unfortunately, if you can't do anything about the echoes or phone conversations, it's a little harder to feel anything unless their situations went to extreme levels of cruelty, and even in those cases, you can't save any of the people in them, you just listen in. That's not to say many of them aren't really sad stories that aren't well written and acted, I have to say, despite the narrative and the division being very short and a little too simple, the voice acting was largely top-notch, that definitely needs to be said. The quips by the enemies do get really repetitive and annoying, and the main joint task force contact, Fei Lao, seemed really generic and flat, though admittedly, I don't know if Melissa O'Neill, the actor playing her, didn't do a strong enough job breathing life into the character, or if Melissa actually did a perfect job of portraying her as blank and monotone and Fei Lao just felt like a boring character as a result. At least I'm put next to much deeper and more interesting characters that exuded a bit of attitude or backstory, like snarky lesbian Dr. Jessica Candle, conspiracy theorist Paul Rhodes, big-hearted former police officer Roy Benitez, psycho Riker leader Lorraine Barrett, or pirate radio podcaster Rick Velassi. If the Echoes were more like watchdogs, where you're gaining info to help someone nearby in real time, that'd be a lot different. There'd be some urgency to trace them closer and hope you can act out the fantasy of saving someone. Or if the Echoes were reserved solely for the SHD or Shade Tech to tell the full backstory of how the outbreak happened and why, instead of lots of unrelated stories, in either of those cases, the Echoes and phone recordings would have been an amazing method to drip feed more of the narrative to players and people would have hungrily hunted them down. But they were too spread out among too many different people for them to appear relevant. I enjoyed each little snippet of people's lives, true. Hearing people laughing and joking and some provided a briefly jarring contrast to the vicious gun battles and grim tone, but once those brief moments were gone, they were kind of gone. Dying Light, on the other hand, may lean heavily on zombie media cliches like, save my loved one, only to find out said loved one has turned, I need to kill said loved one. But there's still more impact felt in encounters like that. Instead of civilians in the division asking me for goods I could use myself, I wish there were camps and safe houses of people that pop up dynamically around the game world that need help. Or how about player safe houses that get regularly attacked by NPCs from one of the factions and I can jump in and help. I get to be greeted by civilians needing protection. I get to see them panicking inside. I get to see them grateful I came along to save them. That'd be way more impactful than, I need a soda. Here's a soda. Thanks for the soda. Another nagging part of the urgency in the division, the main idea is that agents were embedded all over society in case a disaster like a bioterror attack should occur. At which time Directive 51 gets switched on, division agents all over the country get activated in order to keep control and maintain order. But danger in the game only arises when we, the players, start activities a la the Ubisoft open world formula. There's never really any sense that we don't have control. We have it. It's in our hands already. There's no chaos. There's no dynamically escalating danger that pulls us out of our routines or gear farming. The job already feels done. 
The bad guys are conveniently relegated to certain areas and clicking on icons. Why aren't they randomly attacking the base of operations? Why aren't they actively screwing up our safe houses? By the time you clear the map of main story missions, side missions, resource tasks, incursions, and collectibles, most of the areas feel pretty calm. In Dying Light, shit is hitting the fan out there. It's splattering all over the place, and that's a major difference maker in the urgency. There's more of a feeling that things are still in the process of becoming far worse. Whereas in The Division, the worst has already occurred. The outbreak killed thousands, and now Division agents are helping people rebuild. The gangs and militias you fight come off as exploitive, sneaky opportunists rather than a threat to national security. The plague of zombies that infests Haran, however, is growing in number and intensity, and the virus itself, not to spoil too much, starts mutating, offering players more unique zombie types that change up gameplay. I don't know how people stack Dying Light up against, say, horror games. I get the feeling not too well. Dying Light is more of an open world playground than geared towards horror, unless most of your time outside safe zones is spent at night, as the volatiles you run into when darkness descends are aggressive, fast, and don't relent unless you enter a safe zone or daylight returns. They're pretty fucked up looking too. Late into the game, if you have enough high damage weapons, you can eventually dispatch them, but much of the game you'll want to run, jump, and use your agility to get away. Now one interesting twist here, if I'm talking up Dying Light so much, why am I accompanying it with footage from The Division? Well, that's easy to explain. Dying Light's parkour and The Division being very Diablo-like make both somewhat unique, yet easy to shove aside as not innovative enough. Both have received kind of mediocre reviews during their lifespans, and while many of the criticisms they've gotten are justified, I'd come to bat for either in terms of being fun jaunts in their respective worlds. So far I've been speaking from a concept perspective. Dying Light, in my view, captures a way more engaging viral outbreak scenario as it puts you in the thick of the disaster as it's currently happening, as opposed to the post-outbreak restoration services in Division. In one, you're trying to save a city, possibly the world. In the other, you're a government worker with a slightly freer hand to exterminate dangerous elements to protect innocent people from mostly other humans. Then again, while I must seem much more critical of the Division, I've easily spent twice as many hours, if not more so, gear hunting in that game than I did playing endgame content in Dying Light. The following DLC for Dying Light was definitely a great side adventure and story. I played through it after I finished the main story, and the final boss of the DLC was frustrating, but definitely an awesome encounter. But once I was done with Dying Light's story and narratives, I felt like I was kind of done. Meanwhile, The Division initially drew thousands of people to make obvious comparisons to Destiny, mostly due to both games being shooters with different color rarity item drops. Others, however, saw more comparisons to Diablo, as both have a dark, grim tone and way more stat number crunching than Destiny, which is a much simpler and some might argue way too streamlined a gearing experience, without nearly enough different gear or slots to really tinker with. I mentioned at the beginning of this video, The Division just released its free 1.8 update, as well introducing not too long ago global events, which add various modifiers to all activities that earn you global event credits, which can be used to purchase caches with either higher chance to acquire what are called classified sets that have more potent six piece bonuses than the existing sets with only four piece bonuses, and higher chance to acquire exotic weapons. This may not seem like a wild thing to go crazy over, however, after jumping back into the division around the time of the 1.8 update, after having kind of shelved it due to hitting a wall in terms of power, between the new zone, the more balanced rewards, and the current variety and activities, I have to be honest, I'm having more fun with the division than either Destiny game. More than Warframe? Well, like I said in my last video, many of the mission types kind of mimic each other in Warframe, but the mystery, story, and lore, and overall creativity keep that at the top of my list. However, giving the division its due, it seems to pull in ideas from other games very well to write a smaller list of activities, but still more variety among them. To briefly bring things back to Dying Light, outside of maxing out skill trees and PvP competition, the latter of which Bad Blood seeks to enhance, Dying Light isn't as much of a build tweaking kind of game. One of the reasons I like Diablo 3 better than Diablo 2 and Path of Exile is that Diablo 3 eventually made gear tweaking and theory crafting more accessible to a wider audience. I spent plenty of time staring at inventory screens at Diablo 3, switching gear out and experimenting with skill builds, and while the complexity of the number crunching in Diablo 3 doesn't rival Diablo 2 or Path of Exile, they also don't require as many intense Excel calculations to do reasonably well. Anybody can feel like a theory crafter and get back to battling enemies in a reasonable amount of time without feeling obligated to bury oneself in spreadsheets and chalkboard scribbles trying to crack the fucking Da Vinci Code. Dying Light, while being a more intense viral outbreak scenario, doesn't do much of that at all. You can collect new recipes for crazy weapons, but no special set bonus equipment, no tinkering gear to figure out what build works best, nothing like that. Not only does the Division have lots of loot like Diablo, it also has similar activities. Expansion 1 of the Division called Underground introduced a new social hub where players can generate randomized missions, usually involving three short stages per phase, and ending with a boss encounter, a sizable loot drop, as well as credits and experience. If that sounds a lot like Diablo 3's Nephilim riffs, you'd be right. Only Division Underground ups the ante a bit by unlocking the ability to go up the three whole phases in a single underground mission for even more underground experience, meaning more high-end and set reward caches, more Phoenix credits, which can be used to purchase exotic weapons, high-end and set gear outright, as well as directive intel, which can be used to add directives to an underground run that increase the difficulty, but also the rewards. But that was also changed for the better in 1.8. When Underground first released, players had the ability of adding directives, but directives were just simple debuffs, like losing your mini-map or enemies that don't drop ammo, or 
enemies that utilize electric or fire bullets. In 1.8, directives modify gameplay that both strengthens and weakens you in five different ways. For instance, the Compensator Directive. That one gives your weapons drastically less recoil, but less maximum ammo. Kinetic Armor gives you drastically higher armor when moving, but drastically less armor when standing still, like when in cover. And in a cover-based shooter, standing still in cover is kinda common. An interesting one is Electric Tech. That gives your skills drastically shorter cooldowns, but using skills messes up your electrical systems, which isn't even a fancy way of saying your stats drop or get debuffed. It means your heads-up display gets scrambled and you can't see ammo count or read message pop-ups as easy. I really kind of like that one. It's not a debuff that can be quantified or seen in your character sheet, but it still evokes an undeniable level of disorientation. The shock ammo directive gives you free permanent shock bullets for the duration of the run, but when firing your weapons for too long without pausing, you suffer a shock yourself, and during that, you can't move and have lower armor temporarily, leaving you extremely vulnerable, especially at higher difficulties. Finally, adrenal healing offers you a constant low amount of health regeneration, but longer cooldowns on healing skills. If you have enough directive intel, you can add one of these to your underground run. If you're brave and or you're just used to dealing with the negative side of effect, you can add more than one, or even all five, to a full three-phase run, and if done on a hard difficulty, it's part of what earns you an underground weekly cash. It's such a simple feature and concept, but it offers a lot of customization in how you prefer to approach the challenges in underground, similar to, possibly even better than, how Diablo 3 tuned their greater rifts to allow players to inch their way up the torment difficulties slower via greater rift levels that sit between each torment. The Division also has gear-modifying features like Diablo 3 as well. Diablo 3 has the Mystic, which is part of the Reaper of Souls expansion, and the Division has the Recalibration Station, which essentially does the same thing. It allows you to swap out a stat or perk on a weapon or armor piece for another to allow players the ability to fine-tune their gear to optimize their build at the cost of credits. Weapons also require division tech, which is a bit harder to come by. The division also has the optimization station, which boosts the stats and gear score and various equipment to make them stronger. Diablo 3's equivalent might be Kanai's Cube, which can reforge legendaries and set pieces to re-roll their stats in hope of getting an ancient or primal ancient version, or take a piece that's low level and make it a max level 70 version. You can also level up legendary gems acquired in greater rifts in Diablo 3, put a legendary into the cube with the legendary gem and increase its stats a bit that way, though that's more of a focused way to increase just one stat, while the division's optimization station increases all stats on a piece, and that can be done a few times if you have enough credits. Expansion 2 of the division, called Survival, puts you in a separate scenario where your helicopter is shot down, you're injured and suffering from sepsis, you need to scrounge for food, drinks, medicine, materials, and other equipment, craft the virus filter for your mask, find the antivirals that were discovered, and hopefully survive long enough to make it to the dark zone, craft the flare gun, call a helicopter and extract, and do all of this without any of the high-powered weapons or armor you've collected in the rest of the game. You start each survival run completely from scratch. Your accumulated gear and character stay exactly as they are for when you're done playing survival and you want to go back to that. The Division's survival mode, to me, almost feels like a multiplayer shared world roguelike than what some might refer to as a battle royale. Wikipedia describes battle royale game modes as a blend of survival, exploration, scavenging, and a last man standing mechanic. This mode has most of those things. Survival, obviously. Your immunity to disease falls and your hunger and thirst rise as you go. You explore the terrain as you start most runs from a different spot. You scavenge for supplies and weapons, clothing to keep from freezing to death, and materials to craft other necessities. However, unless you're playing the PvP version of survival, I don't think it constitutes last man standing in terms of goals. You don't win by all the other agents dying or leaving the round. Killing all the other players doesn't really expedite you to victory, and it only makes you reasonably safer. You win the survival run by reaching the dark zone, calling the chopper, and extracting, hopefully after collecting the antivirals for extra points. Plus, more than one other player can extract with you, and more than one helicopter can be called, so your own personal victory depends more on extracting than other players living or dying. In the PvP version of survival, players can kill each other on site, but in the PvE version, players can only eliminate each other if one has been down by either hostile NPCs, the elements, or one's health falling, at which point other players can rescue them with a med kit, but they can also execute them and take their stuff. So there is some degree of cutthroat nature going on, but theoretically, you could reach the chopper and not really encounter many other players, if any. Especially in the PvE version, other players are really more of an extra obstacle than what you're actually competing against. This all being said, survival mode doesn't perfectly fit the quote Berlin interpretation of roguelike, L-I-K-E. As it's not turn-based, it doesn't exist on a grid, the environment isn't 100% randomly or procedurally generated, there's no hacking or slashing, etc. But it also doesn't resemble roguelite, L-I-T-E titles, where runs yields can be used to buff, strengthen, and empower you up to make subsequent runs easier. So even though the survival mode doesn't exemplify any of those three types or genres or styles, it seems to take good things from each and make something unique and engaging in the end. What survival does earn you is outside of that mode. Doing enough survival runs or lasting long 
enough in them can award you with equipment and items that can be applied to your overall gear progression and collection on your regular mode characters and acquire you survival points. With enough of those over the course of the week, you can earn a weekly reward cash with really high level rewards, including a guaranteed exotic weapon. Expansion 3 was a team-based PvP mode, Last Stand, where you help player teammates capture points to secure data and win the match against other players. As I said, the 1.8 update tweaked the Dark Zone in an interesting way. Instead of going rogue just by shooting fellow players, going rogue now happens more like Diablo 2, where you quote, turn hostile on other players. Only in the Dark Zone, there's a short cooldown period before going rogue, giving players who don't want to engage that way a brief head start to, well, hopefully get away before they're taken down. Also in the 1.8 update's new zone, West Side Piers, there are three points where players can enter the new Resistance game mode, which when initially reading about it, seemed like just any old horde mode. After trying it out, it seems a bit deeper than that. I entered the activity in a very small room, expecting the door at the end of the room to open when the round started. Nope. Enemies just dropped in from the ceiling. Killing them dropped shade tech points, which when acquired can then be used to open the door that led outside to a much wider open space, tons of obstacles, but also supply boxes spread around to restock and keep competitive in the fight. Even when adding something as simple as a horde mode, the division applies some creative thinking to turn it into something more than just a horde mode. I really never thought I'd be as impressed as I am with how well the division's activities are being built upon. Another interesting twist to all this, depending on where your fun actually comes from in these games or what you prioritize, maybe the backstory and concept don't matter as much. Sure, the division's story had a lot less narrative, and in the end game, the focus is more on high value target hunting, supply drops, incursions, daily and weekly assignments, and the other activities I mentioned earlier. Basically, different ways to generate loot. The division needed a stronger concept or conceptual execution if it really wanted to be the epic success many had hoped for, but because the lore to play the division is mostly in the activities and the loot, and the fact that one, the game costs less than Destiny even with the gold edition or season pass attached, and two, it's already at a better and healthier place than Destiny was after only one year, the division kind of doesn't need a better concept at the same time. Lots of people critical of the division would have liked to see the game's concept fleshed out much better to really nail that Tom Clancy level of storytelling and deep political intrigue that name brings with it, and I'd agree, even with a simple concept like a bioterror attack on Black Friday in New York, there's far more intriguing ways the backstory can be told, and who knows, maybe we'll get more of it coming soon. The West Side Piers added in more phone conversation collectibles, and even the few I've found so far already seem to be adding more backstory, as well as future teases, so while the Division's narrative may be short, their continued support for the game seems to be doing all the right types of things, and it's turning into one of my favorite loot hunts at the moment. Another thing I'm extremely surprised to be saying, but willing to say nonetheless. Dying Light was more narrative-based, so its concept and mood needed to be impactful, and they nail both quite well in my opinion. The emphasis there isn't on repetition or farming gear, crafting more than farming since it's a zombie game, which is mostly formulaic these days. However, the Bad Blood DLC that's coming out next year, oddly enough, sounds a lot like the Division's Dark Zone and even survival mode a bit. I put a link in the description to Dying Light's Bad Blood playtest, and honestly, I knew Dying Light was putting out a new PvP update, but I had no idea how much it resembled the Division, and reading about it only made me want to put this together even more. Here's some text that introduces Bad Blood to people looking to jump on board with the playtest. Quote, You and five other players are dropped into a hostile zombie-infested area. Each of you has the same goal, to evacuate before night falls. Use your parkour skills to swiftly traverse the city, scavenging for weapons that will give you an edge over your opponents, but remember the clock is ticking. To pay for a seat on the extraction chopper, you need to harvest blood samples from the infected. Form dynamic alliances with other players to get tactically and as formidable zombie bosses, and then turn on your allies to steal their samples. In a cruel setup where everyone fights for the survival of the few, betrayal is not a question of if, but when. The more samples the players harvest collectively, the more seats are unlocked, but everyone pays for their seat individually, which means the alliances are short-lived and can easily end with a stab on the back. Make sure you have enough evacuation points before the chopper arrives, and don't get killed as you race to the extraction zone." Unquote. Couple notes here. First, I'm not really a PvP-style player. I'm much more into cooperative play when I jump into multiplayer, but this seems like a pretty interesting way to get players re-engaged in Dying Light, especially with other online games likely falling into ruts. Second, to those people hearing this who may take my mention of this as some conspiratorial thing, I'm not suggesting Techland, the folks behind Dying Light, were looking to rip off Division's modes, just as I don't think Massive, the folks behind the Division, were looking to rip off Diablo's Nephilim Rifts, or Bloodborne's Chalice Dungeon customization, or roguelite gameplay of any kind with some of their updates. But who knows, maybe the idea that these two games were rather similar wasn't as original as I'd like it to be. When I Google both games at the same time, most of the links that come up are just people asking which game should I get, with timestamps from a year ago. It's very possible the developers of both were fans of each other. Either way, if anyone hears this and thinks I'm taking a side, fuck that noise. I like both games a lot. I have room in my heart for both. I may be a sucker for loot hunts and gear tweaking, so the division keeps me more invested in the long term, but I did love my time with Dying Light a whole lot. If they make Dying Light 2, I'm likely on board, or at least I'll be very intrigued where they go with it next. If anyone wants to argue with each other which is better, feel free to do so in the comments. While I want this channel to mostly be dedicated to helping social issues move toward resolutions, I also want to take some time to weigh in on my favorite pastimes as well. We'll see what the future holds on all fronts. This is Killer Cardinal DA7 reminding you to use your head, be nice to each other, and take the time to think. Talk to you later. And when you see the dead bodies, get your masks on quick. Otherwise, you're dead.